the worst And there is nothing left for me to hate So I can lay me down My brothers on the ground I bled today until Coyote comes to raise me up Hello everybody, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. I am Cammy Black. Um, it's We're doing our Lions Tour retrospective this evening and you, you may notice we're, we're not joined by John, Ian, Craig or Johnny. We've got two special guests. Now, relations between the Scots and the Welsh in particular have, have soured somewhat during the Lions Tour. So I thought I should do my day. This is my David Hasselhoff stood on the Berlin Wall moment trying to bring everybody together. <laughs> So what what we've done we've got um we've got Phil Lewis joining us. Good evening, Phil. Good evening, Cammy. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Phil. And we also have uh, Rhiannon Garth Jones with us as well. Good evening, Ree. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, not, neither of you sound Welsh, but you, do, you do support Wales. I should say that this is this isn't just me going <laughs> yeah, for diversity. I was and, say, yeah. <laughs> just my, name, me my name makes me look a lot more Welsh than myself. <laughs> 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 and I've got no excuse. I've got, I've got nothing to my name. <laughs> That's fine. Well, Lewis is kind of Welsh, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's good <laughs> enough. It's good enough. It's, it ticks the diversity box for this evening, and that's what I'm after. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, we're live at the minute on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, as well as our super secret social media group uh, that you can get into if you are one of our Patreons. So if you're watching live, feel free to get involved in the comments and we can pick out some of the best ones. Uh, you can also listen to the audio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and all the random different podcast apps that are out there, including Acast and, and things like that. If, if you've got a podcast app that we're not on, let me know and we can sort that out. Um, you can visit the blog, scottishrugbyblog.co.uk. We've got lots going on there. Um, usually, we're going to be talking about the um, Forsock, for, no, sorry, the Foz Rock. I must get that right, Super 6. But, but I'm not going to. I wasn't going to subject subject Phil and uh, Ray to that, making them watch three three games of semi pro Scottish rugby before coming on the pod. So <laughs> we'll pick that up next week when everyone's back. Um, the Lions, then, uh, Phil. I'll start with you. How, how was that tour for you? How did it feel? Weird. I think weird is the easiest way I can describe it. Trying to look back to how things were back in 2017. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, dis disjointed. It didn't seem like it It really ever felt like we were coming together. I, it might have something to do with the fact that I had, uh, I ended up watching all three tests in various different locations that weren't pubs. None of them were pubs, which is where I, usually, it's usually where you get the, it's where the where, where you get the best out, out of the Lions. I'm used to watching the World Cup and the Six Nations and things. I live in London, even though I'm Welsh. So I'm used to going down to local London pubs and in my Welsh jersey, given as good as I can get from Scots, Irish and English for those, um, uh, for those sort of early spring months for the Six Nations. And then I really look forward to getting in a pub with people all in the same red jersey and, and cheering on the same the same team for once. And I think I really missed that. And I think that's what my over, overarching opinion and feeling from it was that it just felt a bit weird, um, which is a real shame because I think it was the most 
diverse like bunch of players we've had in many years, which is obviously um, from you, from your guys' neck of the woods. It was a really exciting prospect in terms of like recent years of number of like sort of Scots involved and that. So it had a potential to be a really sort of a really good tour in that respect. And I think yeah. it just felt a bit flat having having no no way to get together and celebrate it. Yeah, I think we've we've said on the podcast the last couple of weeks. It's kind of weird being Scottish on this tour because we we have got quite a lot of skin in the game and. I, have, I don't think any of us expected to have as much skin in the game as we did in the tests, but but there we are. And it's probably the most invested I've been in a tour since since '97. But <laughs> it kind of but the, so then I've, I've got nothing to compare with it because in '97 I was underage drinking in pubs around Berwick. So <laughs> I don't think I watched the Lions game. I watched the Lions game at home. You know, I watched the Lions game on Sky at home in '97, but I wasn't sat in pubs. So I've got I haven't really got anything to compare it to. Re. I mean, how how was it for you? Sure. Did it feel kind of like a normal tour or, or do kind of like the COVID, whole COVID thing and the whole that they're all locked up together feel it weird? I think for me, the way I tend to watch Lions tours, just I think because randomly when they fall, is it's sort of the opposite of Phil. I very rarely get to go to the pub and watch them. I'm almost always in Burnley with my parents. So it's like me and my dad watching it and my dad yelling at the English players. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which, like, is not normally that dedicated a Wales fan. Um, so in a lot of ways, this was weirdly similar, except also, obviously, like, it really, really wasn't. Um, like, I was feeling it was very... The whole thing felt very weird. Like, normally I feel like I'm really missing out in a lot of ways because I'm just, like, there watching it with my dad trying to, like, find a stream. Um, and this time it kind of felt like everyone was in a in a fairly similar position. Like I watched one of the games, I watched the last test in the pub, which was really nice. And it was really lovely to watch it with friends, but then kind of everyone in the pub who was watching the Lions game disappeared immediately afterwards. So you didn't really get the vibe in the way that you would another big one do that. Um, yeah. But I think that you, the thing that you said there about COVID, like I was thinking about this before coming on, like it's definitely been a very underwhelming tour in a lot of ways. But I, I wonder if that's I wonder if that's yeah I wonder if that's a reporting though because normally if you think I, I know some of the journalists went over in the end, but presumably they all the reporting on it they all get access to the players they all kind of the players get access to wander around and go and see the sites and do all the touristy stuff as well so there must be stories but essentially they're all locked up in a hotel so apart from the stuff that the Lions put on YouTube we don't really know what they're up to and that stuff's obviously really yeah. kind of choreographed and organized so we, we we've only really been able to see what they want us to see this tour and that's kind of weird but to yeah. be fair even with the even with even with the documentaries like that's filtered that's what that's they choose what to put in that but we still talk about those documentaries of those famous tours some of them we talk about more than the actual results of the matches themselves because they're that sort of infamous like Zebo having to call up his his um Toulon manager and asking him to be captain next season like that's an infamous clip that goes round like I'm not like we still have got little bits of stuff like that but it seemed like the whole you hear stories of like lions walking down the streets in 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 Australia and like Aussie fans don't know who they are because it's not a big thing to them. But then, like, you'll get like an occasional like mob of red-shirted Lions fans that have made the journey across and will go and give them like ask for autographs and stuff. And you you obviously got none of that this time. Um, and so, yeah, there's a there's a big old aspect to it that was I think that was missing from it. I think if you separate out um, the kind of refereeing stuff, which I imagine we'll come to at some point. Yeah. Pretty much. I'm uh, going there so early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bet some money on that. Um, pretty much everything that was weird and underwhelming about this tournament is kind of what you would expect if you sat down and thought about how this would be like at this exact moment. Like there weren't fans, the players didn't have the same kind of tour experiences they usually do. There wasn't the same access to them. Most people probably weren't watching it in a pub actually with their friends. Like I'm sure some people were, but it wouldn't have been as many and as much as maybe like in the past. Things like the disruption to all the games, so like the randomly constantly changing schedule and the players playing like four matches in 13 days or whatever madness it was. like, And as well, things like you wouldn't schedule, you know, like 
when this was originally scheduled, obviously it's just a four year thing. We didn't, the Olympics wasn't supposed to be on at the same time with all of its like incredibly wholesome, uplifting vibes. And even just like, <laughs> very different vibes. <laughs> say that with such resentment as if it's like damn you olympics for getting in the way of rugby values <laughs> yeah. I mean, i'm sure somebody will but even things just like um like the hundred which like you know there might not be a lot of crossover there but like the hundred this really big flashy free to air uh on telly like tournament that's new and it's shiny and it's got live fans there like there's just a lot of stuff that i think this wasn't a normal tour and I think to hold it to the standards of a normal tour is kind of, it, it's just going to make us even more disappointed, I think, really. Like, the Autumn Nations Cup wasn't representative of rugby last year, and this isn't, I think, representative of the Lions. It's just really unfortunate that it happened with this kind of timing, so we didn't get the big festival of rugby that we would have wanted and that Scotland fans could finally have felt like really joyously. <laughs> yeah. And, and I do think the kind of, you know, that obviously there's a social media side of it as well that has been, I think people, have, ah, it's hard for me because I think it's as a Scotland fan, certainly in the last two years, social, this social media around the lines has never been a particularly pleasant time because it's mostly people saying, thank God there's no Scots here. Um, <laughs> as a, so, so this time it's not been. I haven't really felt any different because it's well, we don't want any Scots in the in the test team is what you might generally get, and all the Scottish players are rubbish. But then equally, you've got Scottish fans saying, "Well, all the other players are rubbish." But I wonder, outside of the social media kind of bubble, I, I don't like you know, Twitter's not real life, is it? So. No, there'd be plenty of other people no. who've watched the tour and enjoyed it for what it is, who yeah. aren't even on Twitter. Yeah, yeah and that's the thing, and that's what I'm saying about missing the pubs and stuff as well. Is that you might see yeah. two or three accounts from both sides of that particular sort of divide that you described there, both voicing equally rubbish opinions about certain players, and you could go down the pub and be arm in arm with a Scot, having no idea that they feel that way, but you just end up cheering on the same guys, and it's just you wouldn't say stuff to people's face, and that's the difference with Twitter, isn't well, it? Everyone's just. Would... You Chuck would say, but I, I think sometimes you do because I mean I've been to international matches in the pub with opposition fans, and I don't think some of the stuff people obviously some of it's over the line, but the stuff that people say on Twitter because you you kind of it's ripped to the context within which it's said. Mm-hmm. If someone says in a pub, Stuart Hogg's a crap player, he drops the ball all the time, and you're in a good mood and you're having wow. a laugh with a guy, you you have a bit of back and forward, or and it's. Back fine and it's a good laugh and it's nice to kind of have that engagement with people but yeah, on absolutely. deprived of a face like a human face and context and just, yeah if you're just speaking to someone a pic a profile picture of somebody's dog with a couple of flags next to it then you know that that tends to kind of raise the blood pressure levels when they start slagging you off as opposed to in a pub and it's a real person and they've got a smile on their face when they say it i think there's like a very basic thing that like on any kind of social media really yeah it's that you lose the context right but also like you just get these like floating sort of statements that are presented like facts so like when my dad's mate says oh like Dan Big is really crap for and like he shouldn't be the starting 10 I can like we can have that kind of back and forth joking and and there is a context right but when someone just posts that on Twitter and you scroll past and you see it and you're like what is this nonsense like where has this come from there's no and it, even though it's even though it is the same thing, it just feels a lot worse because, yeah, you don't have that immediate context of, of even if it's just a, like someone you've met in the pub, but they're wearing a shirt, right? So you can identify them as a fan. Yeah. Or, yeah, and, someone you know I, the tone of it, like... And the discussion lasts, what, five, ten minutes, and then you move on to something else as opposed to the discussion lasts three days because someone keeps coming back to you. Keeps because... tracking at the mentions. Oh, yeah. someone's retweeted it again. Here we go again. Yeah, I've barely been on. So this is the other thing that's been a bit weird for me this tour. Like for personal reasons, I haven't been as uh, like online and I haven't been as devouring as much like kind of content as I might have been normally. So I've sort of missed a lot of this. But like literally every time I've checked in on Twitter in the last four weeks, I think I've just immediately wanted to put the phone down. Like I, I think there's been a lack of content though, because aside from. Like early on when Robbie Henshaw sellotaped Bill to that gantry in Jersey and we all had a laugh about it. There's been like, the videos are all very nice, but there's there's no, we haven't really seen into it. I know what you're saying, Phil, about the documentaries. We don't get to see those until at least, what, six six to 12 months afterwards by the time they 
yeah. pulled it all together and got everyone's approval to put in the shenanigans. I hadn't even realized it. I was watching the, they did a podcast of the 97 tour and they kind of reunited some of the people and they had the documentary filmmakers and I had, they'd actually kicked them out of the room halfway yeah. through the court session. And you think, Christ, if that's what they got on film, what the hell happened in there that they didn't want on film? I do wonder actually, like, not to <laughs> depress us further, but like, if this aspect is obviously very specifically like a COVID thing, like players are in the bubble, but I do wonder like how much more like the Lions management will look at that and go, well, maybe we should keep it more sanitised in future. Maybe we should restrict access and control the content a bit more. And if just kind of by chance, but also because that is the way that a lot of like, you know, rugby is increasingly professional and decreasingly sort of charmingly amateur in the way that you have access to the players a lot of the time. And the Lions has always been a bit behind that process, I think. But maybe this is like, maybe now it will kind of speed up and, and catch up with everything yeah. else, which would be really, uh, that would be dispiriting, be, I think. Be, yeah, it'd be but, a shame because you wouldn't then get Jamie Roberts playing guitar with the Mannix mid-tour, do you know what I mean? Which is you know one of the highlights from the Twitter. I feel you know. like that would be hashtag good content, so we'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> The other yeah. stuff we might not see. <laughs> okay, we've got we, we've got a new section on the podcast. We started it last week, so it, it felt like a good thing to continue it for this week for um for our Lions review, which is belters and bams. With belters being good things and bams being um, well, it's short for bam pots for those that uh, th- <laughs> those those non Scottish listeners. Um, so That's I've like asked that I'm like you've been hit for being like stupid. It works as well. I mean, that works as well. We can. Uh... <laughs> Can I ambiguity there. Yeah. Um, so we'll uh, let's start with the belters. We'll try. Let's try and be positive. For what did you have as a belt there? I well, for starters, the big one would obviously be um, white chocolate himself, Finn Russell. Yes. It's it, it's got to be. It's got to be the the guy was Iceman. Honestly, I was absolutely joyed by his arrival at ten minutes. Obviously not entirely because of Dan Bigger's injury. I didn't actually want to see him go off that way, but I feel like it, I feel like the conversation around him is so polarizing. It's like you either got people that absolutely worship the ground he walks on, or think he's the biggest liability to be ever introduced to rugby. And the fact of the matter is, is that he's actually just a damn good rugby player, and he showed that. Like I think it was yourself actually that, that pointed out with the way he runs onto the pitch. Gives a wink to Alan Wynn and pats him on the stomach. Yeah. It's like he calls him oh, big man, man as well. <laughs> to have that confidence, to have that confidence to walk in probably about fifty minutes early to his to a decider lions test, going right. You got to do your thing now, um, and just handle it the way that he did. Like, just it was it was great. It was it was probably the, the moment I will take away from the tour is that yeah. sort of period in that th- in that third test when it's all looking a bit dour after 10 minutes, it's all very chip and, and like sort of niggle. And uh, he comes on and starts flinging it about like he did. And it was just joy to behold because everyone I was watching it with, I was actually at an 80th birthday party <laughs> from my girlfriend's nan. And, but there was like four or five of us held in a corner that were watching and all of us sort of just all sat up in our seats and just like readjusted and sat forward. I'm like, yeah, same. That's happening, yeah. So that for me, that was that that was my belter for sure. It was yeah, brilliant. And I'm sorry if I've nicked yours, Rhiannon. No, <laughs> well, second dude, but I would add to that, and I, and I do want to explain this a little bit because I'm aware that I'm on like a, the Scottish uh, rugby podcast. That uh, at no point when Finn Russell was on the pitch did I miss Dan Bigger, and I mean right. that like in the best way. Like I love Dan Bigger. I would have had Finn start the test, and I would have had Dan Bigger finish them. Uh, or whichever way around they wanted to do yeah. it, like they would have been my two. But I would have explained that by saying, you know, I think they're both more versatile than people give them credit for, but they still have clear strengths, and that's how I would have used them. But yeah, after the first kick, I felt confident that Finn was going to take his kicks really well. I thought his kicking on the field was really good. Like he didn't just get the attack moving in that first half. Like he did a lot of the stuff that I would have expected. Dan Bigger to do and Finn Russell to maybe do, but not with the same level of certainty. 
And I think I can't remember what point in the game it was where he put a kick in like in between the the fullback and the winger, and it was just right into the twenty two and just caused absolute chaos. And I was like, "That's not what you expect Finn Russell to do, but it's what he shows he can do." And I was like, "Well, there you go. Then he's, he's just showing these. He really is the uh, whole package." I think the really lovely thing is like probably part of the reason that the debate is around like Finn is so polarized is because like the people who see him most right are like Scottish fans or like Glasgow fans, and they obviously do see a broader range of what he can do. In the same way that like everyone is biased to their own team, not just because they're one-eyed lunatics, but because you see your own team play more. Like you just have more one-eyed lunatics. <laughs> I mean, we're all one-eyed loons, but also like you see your teams play more. Like you're just more likely to know the nuances of a player's like strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I think it's really great actually that like that many fans got to see Finn play that well in a varied way, not just like the cats out of rave stuff. And that was really great because hopefully then we can have a slightly less boring conversation about whether he's good or not, and whether he's reliable yeah. or not, and like <laughs> what kind of game he can play or not. Like he can't really. Win. I think the problem with Finn Russell is because of the way he plays, he can't win. Because even there are some people who have even said that well, he came on and had a good first 10, 15 minutes, and then he faded away. But actually, because I'm watching it back today, I don't, I don't think that's true. I think it's that he worked. He, he took advantage of the fact that he was an unknown quantity to the box and caused absolute yeah. havoc, and they're a world-class defence. So, of course, they're going to adjust. And so they, yeah. this guy's going to run in the middle of us and start chipping over our heads, lads. We need to watch him. Yeah. So, of course, he's going to sit back and do things, you know, do things a little bit differently. And, and, and they maybe... reacted to him, and he reacted to them. Like, that's what yeah. you want your top-level fly half to do. And it might not have been quite as thrilling to watch in the second half, and obviously, you know, win it. Win it. But, like, he, yeah, he reacted exactly as you would want your fly half to do in that situation. The, I think the, Finn, the, Finn Russell, the Finn Russell critics would have expected the way he played in that second half to have us lost that test by 20 points. At all. Yeah. That's what they would have expected. And he, yeah. the fact that we didn't shows that he still controlled the game. And it was decisions that were not necessarily to do with him that could took the test away from us, in my, in my mind. Yeah, I think it's an unfair rap for his kicking percentage as well, because... I'd be interested. I, I tried to look this up, but I can't find the stats on it. Is if you look at his kicking stats, say in the last two to three years, I would think they would be up with kind of the Dan bigger levels from what I've seen of him kicking. I don't know he's like it rassing, but certainly for Scotland, he's he's been very high percentage. But I think his percentage yeah. comes down overall career wise because he wasn't very good at kicking when he first <laughs> kind of came on the scene, and, and we had Greg Laidlaw's kind of metronomic boot doing it for Scotland, so he didn't have exactly. to. Exactly. So. I think there are also other things that kind of warp your perception of stuff. Like, everyone has this idea that Owen Farrell is an amazing kicker because he does really well take, like, crucial sort of, like, clutch kicks. But actually, his overall kicking percentage is a lot lower than most people realise, and that's partly because he takes harder kicks, maybe, or where he takes them in the field. But, like, he's not as high a kicker as you think. Lee Halfpenny is also a little bit lower than you'd think because he tends to take the really long-range ones now for Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing with Finn is, one, people remember the start and they just cannot get that out of their head. And they also have that image of that, like, really unfortunate time he fell over in front of the post <laughs> and just, like, skied it, which I was joking about in the pub when we were watching it. I was like, in my head, I know, factually know that Finn is a way better kicker than that. But every time I see him line up a goal kick, that is the first thing I remember. I'm like, I dismiss that as an idiotic thing. <laughs> I think a lot of people do remember it, though. Like, well, um, that the reason that one was that was against France, and the reason the sure. referee was on the mic on the had it, and the TMO and the earpiece getting them to review something about the trial that had just been scored. And the rule is, yeah. if you kick the conversion or attempt the conversion, then they can't then go to the TMO and, and wipe off the score. So he also slipped, I think, as because he was yeah, he did. it so much, he just slipped and fell on his ass. The whole was, thing was hilarious. Nathan Hines basically said, "Take the kick, take it now." It was right in front of the post, and yeah. I don't know what happened. Yeah, but I do think that's the kind of thing you know. It is so kind of funny that you do remember it, and even if you're not deliberately like putting that in your mind as like an example of Finn's actual kicking ability. It's just the kind of thing that distorts people's perceptions. Yeah. People, I, they just hang on to their earlier ideas of stuff for ages. Like. I think that's it. And also this idea that you can't do well behind a pack that's not, that's struggling. I, I don't know any fly half in the world that's, that's done well 
when that, the pack in front of them is struggling. And I don't know what – that yeah. kind of feels like a bit of a cell phone to me if the kind of English – and Irish fans and Welsh fans are saying that because like, well, all right, so your lads are behind a struggling pack a lot. Because yeah. <laughs> Finn, let me tell you, I've seen if you've yeah. watched Scotland play, Finn Russell is used to playing behind a struggling pack. I was good. At, yeah, I always think that's really funny. Like so to, Dan Bigger is very good at playing behind a struggling pack because he's very used to it. Like, and like I would absolutely say that. But yeah, I would also be like, I think Finn understands yeah. <laughs> how to play without a lot. Like, it's, he's not been at Rassing that long. Like, it's not like he was terrible before. <laughs> saying saying Finn's only good going forward, to me, just marks you out as a very, very casual rugby viewer straight away. If someone's to stand next to me watching a game that I've not watched them before, and like yeah. that, just they'll say something like that, and I'll be right. Yeah, okay, you um, you have no idea what you're talking about, do you? It's you very just, like you just read George Hildoff is a better running threat. Like, or yeah. he plays back to the line kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fine. Like, I think it's not. You know, some people only watch the game casually, and you know, I think we would probably all agree that the commentators and the pundits way too often don't do a very good job of conveying what's happening. Oh, hundred percent. When, yeah. when you're used to listening to Giffy yell, he's really great flat to the line. Like, you're going to take that away as like a perfectly reasonable comment. If, if but, anything, actually, yeah. if, if the one thing you could say to Will for Will in Will Greenwood's favour, which is not a lot, obviously, but it is is he does that well, but only because he plays the role of a man sitting watching it on the telly at home and just saying saying the first thing that comes into his head. Seeing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I hope that will get better. But I do think if you watch that game as a very casual viewer, um, probably what you would take away is like, Finn got the attack moving in the first half, and in the second he kicked his goals. Yeah. Like, he got them moving around the park with his kicking. He kicked his goals. He did the things you would expect a Dan Bigger or an Owen Farrell type fly half to do. At least they'll get that he's versatile and that yeah. there's something more than this kind of really boring, simplified debate. There's a couple of other things that he does, and I think a couple of people picked it up, um, particularly with the Maul, Ken Owens try, is the fact that during that he he tells Bundyaki to stay back and keeps him in, keeps him outside of him, and then tells him when to go into the mall. So he's actually his game manage. It's kind of one of those things. I think people don't think it's something he does, but his game management's really good. He's the one. His, his communication, particularly with Ali Price, has always been excellent. I was going but, to say another belt of me is I thought um, Ali Price just in the I know, I'm not going to say he's the best scrum half in the world, Cammy. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. But he's no I Finley he Christie. Was, I, did, <laughs> <he's not laughs> Christie. Uh, I did think he was very good, and I thought it was a, you know I understood why they did the scrum halves the way they did because they clearly really wanted Murray to come on and like be a bench captain. When, like, mm-hmm. logically in other circumstances, you would have probably paired Murray and Bigger up and Price and Finn up from the start. But the way Finn came on early meant he got all that time playing with Ali Price. And I actually thought both of them did really well from a game management point of view. Like, it wasn't a brilliant game. You didn't get to see them show off. But in a really, really hard game against an incredibly tough opposition, both, like, physically and intelligently in terms of defence. I thought they were really good. I thought most players were pretty good, to be honest. I don't think people played yeah. badly. They just didn't play as well. As no, we no, got think, to our bombs yet. We'll get to, our, we'll get to the bombs. I think, <laughs> yeah, Ali, Ali, Ali Price was one of my belters. I think he, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of coming into the tour that didn't think much of him. And again, I, I get it. I think, you know, they haven't, not everybody sits and watches the Rainbow Cup slash Pro 16 or whatever it is this week. And the Irk, it's the Irk now. <laughs> Ulti- it will always be the ultimate rugby championship. I know it's the United, but it'll always be that's it's United. I it's United much. rugby Champ- <laughs> championship. <laughs> Ulti- <laughs> it really needs to be. I'm surprised that Jay Z hasn't that. made them change it yet. To be honest, <laughs> also um, the South African teams aren't going to play for like the first month. All the teams going to be mad again. But yeah, but I, I think if you're not used to Ali Price, you might not have yeah. realised how good he's, he is. He's, better than he was i think you know he had he had a bit of time a couple of years ago where he basically put on a load of weight and lost a lot of form and then yeah. he sorted himself out and now he's better now he's he's better he's really good and his kicking's accurate i don't i think the one thing is i wonder is is they obviously picked him and went with him in the particularly in the first and the third test because they wanted to do the contestable box kicking and the kick chase 
and he's really accurate with it. I'm not sure that Conor Murray is, but I can't think who else they could have taken with them that could have think, done that I think, with... I think Murray is when he's... like Murray, when he's really good, I think is. And I think him and Ali Price made a lot of sense from that point of view. And I think realistically... Uh, in other circumstances, Gareth Davis would not have been on that tour and it would have been Ben Youngs because as much as we all like to take the mick out of Ben Youngs and as flaky <laughs> as he can be, so often, so amusingly, again, when he's on four, <laughs> his kicking game is very good and I think that's actually what they wanted from their scrum halves and it was just that Ben Youngs pulled out and they were basically left with options of people who weren't fit or were Gareth Davis. Yeah. Um, they went with Gareth Davis. <laughs> <laughs> well, he never had to get. He never had to get anywhere near a test side, thankfully. But <laughs> yeah, I really I mean, do think. I really, I really do. Because I think. I really think the captaincy really thing messed with Murray. In to to my mind, I think the captaincy thing really messed with Murray. Um, I, this is a completely left field opinion. And I'm not really touted by anybody else. I'm just, just something that I think didn't sit well with him and I don't know I, I just don't I just don't think it sat with him at all it was a really weird choice considering he hadn't ever been sort of put in that circles for the Irish team and then to throw him in there as tour captain I think you could almost feel like you could see how he was playing in the warm-up games if it, he was playing like a man with the world on his shoulders um, and I think it just I think it just messed up his tour to my mind I think we know he can play a lot better than that um and I think yeah, the problem I, is though they, they they took a they took it was I don't know what the average age was but it wasn't an all I suppose the only other option then would be Ken who's let's face it Ken you know Ken wasn't a nailed on start for the tests at also, the start of the tour. That, this is something maybe we'll come back to, but I think Gatlin might have been a little bit reluctant. You know, Murray wasn't nailed on to start either, but I think. Gatlin might have been a little bit reluctant to pick Ken and be like, yeah, I picked another Welsh player and what? Like, I think he was... Um, I think the last tour really got to him in terms of mm. how uh, how the media responded to a lot of stuff. And I think I don't think he'd previously felt a need to kind of take the lion's sort of values and the legacy side of it as seriously. I think his priority was just winning and he wasn't bothered about anything else. And I think after that, he was, I think for this tour, when he signed up to it, he probably would have been a little bit more conscious of the, of the need just to be aware of that kind of management side of stuff. And had there been more 50-50 calls, say, with the Scottish players, I think he might have been inclined to go for them in a way that in the past he hasn't. As it turned out, there was no need to, because to my mind, actually, all those Scotland players picked themselves. They were all really great. Um, and the same for coaches. But I do think a little bit of Gatlin would have been like, well, if I pick Ken, then I'm just picking like the third, fourth Welsh player in a row as captain. Murray does have the experience. It's his third tour. He's going to be in the 23 because Gareth Davis is not. He is respected by the other players. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, he was not. Uh, you know, he's not an obvious captain in a lot of ways. He's not an obvious test captain. But mm. to be a third captain is a different thing, right? You just yeah. need the respect of the other players and you need to kind of bring everyone together. And I think, I don't disagree that I think Murray struggled and that might well have been a part of it. Um, and he did certainly feel, from the bits of the tour games that I saw, like he was kind of pushing it in a bit in maybe a way that he wouldn't have done otherwise. But I don't think he was a bad choice. I just think... Yeah, it's the, ex it's the execution, isn't it? I mean, there was an interview with um, Finley Calder in um, one of the papers today. I can't remember which one it was now for the life of me. But he was talking about when he was captain uh, in Australia, I want to say in 89, but I might have the year wrong. It might have been 88. I don't know. Um, the And he, had, he picked Brian Moore as his co-captain because he said, I was fine with the lads and Brian knew more about rugby than me. <laughs> so I delegated the rugby to Brian and then I sorted out the kind of pastoral stuff of making sure everyone was happy and together and kind of doing what they were supposed to be doing. And I wonder whether or not there's an element, well, it, you know. I think it was, yeah. Who else is doing, you know, I suppose if you've, if Alan Wynn, Alan Wynn is known for, Alan Wynn Jones is known for ages that he's going to be captain and he'd have that in his mind, who's the leadership team, who's, who am I delegating tasks to, what's my role within all of this? And for Murray just to be landed with it, 
I think, you know, swirly, it probably was quite a lot. It was quite a curveball for him, yeah. And it yeah. is a big, it's a big thing. But I'm not really sure, you know, this is probably the kind of thing that people would love debating. There's no other obvious candidate to me anyway. Like, you well, you go out and put Maro Atoji or something, but then he's quite young and he'd just be kind of like doing slam Sam poetry was, nights Sam and was stuff. Young. Sam, Sam, Sam was younger. picked as a young captain. Sam was, Sam younger, was younger, wasn't he? But also I think, um, like, Sam was a different kind of player in some ways. I also think Sam, Sam was a young Wales captain. And then mm. he was yeah, yeah. quite a young Lions captain, but he'd been the Wales captain for two years. To say tomorrow... Okay, by the way, I know you haven't even captioned Saracens yet, but do you fancy being the Lions caption? <laughs> is quite like, that's quite a job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the, all the other kind of, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure there will be people screaming Stuart Hogg at me when they listen oh, to this. God. Like, I'm just not having the Gatlinwood pick a player, a player at 15 as the captain. It's impractical. No, it's, but yeah, let's not, we've, we've, we've had long debates. Uh, Johnny McGinty's not here tonight to defend himself, so let's not go there. I know there. you're listening, though, Johnny McGinty. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're out there, Johnny McGinty. God damn you. Um, <laughs> Ree, what's one of your belters then? Uh, so I also thought Maro and Robbie Henschel great. Mm-hmm. Um, I genuinely, you know, I think there were some players who had bad moments, but I don't think anyone was like particularly dreadful. I thought most of them did fine and incredibly tough, tight test matches but I thought Maro stood out a lot and I thought Robbie Henshaw stood out consistently um, and they've they've definitely both come away with like reputations properly enhanced I would say um, yeah. to me kind of inexplicable that the centre partnership wasn't Aki and Henshaw from the start and not I love Chris Harris I thought it was really harsh on him to be dropped after the second test just the pure thing of like they play together, they've played together for years and years and years. Some some of your partnerships have to be like pre-existing partnerships. Yeah. <laughs> like cohesion is a massive part of why the especially line if, struggle. Especially especially if your other key partnerships aren't gonna be. If you know you're forced into a position of yeah. starting Ali Price and Dan Bigger, your nine and ten are not gonna be a tried and tested combination. You wanna try and make up for that cohesion somewhere else. Yeah, and I think like in the past, Gatland has picked a lot of Wales players, and you can make a lot of jokes about that, and you could be, get quite defensive about it. But the simple fact is, like, Lions teams tend to do better when they have a good fit <laughs> spine of players from like one core grouping, whether that's a club team or an international team, because they just know each other better. And the problem of a scratch team is that you're scratched. <laughs> like, it's really, really hard to develop yeah. the kind of relationship over six weeks that you would get for like. Six, seven years since Henshaw and Aki started playing together at Connacht. Like, I think um, that's. I mean, even you look at the Scotland players, and and that's what they've done. It with the exception of Hamish Watson, who's the only back Scottish back row that got picked. You've got you know Ferguson and Sutherland. There's a, the stats of Scottish yep. front row. You add uh, Hogg and Duhan at the back, and then you've got Price yep. and Price and and Finn and Chris Harris because Chris Harris can play anywhere. Yeah, Chris Harris it, it, worked as an outside Finn option as, as a partnership, just in like yeah. a broader sense. Yeah, and then he can fill in the back three. I think the thing that surprised me with it with, with the third test, and I think maybe what when we're talking about established combinations, is I think it was a big roll of the dice for the third test to go for Adams and Williams. But having said that, they didn't look like they were playing their first test match together. Well, because so, I mean they obviously, I mean, they obviously play together for Wales, but like yeah. they also play together outside Dan Bigger for Wales. So like, and the idea of two big boys in the centre, I think, is probably not alien. <laughs> <laughs> two Welsh backs. <laughs> so like, I, yeah. When I was picking my like Lions team at the start, I would have relied more heavily on combinations, and maybe we'll discuss this later with the the general team selection. But um, yeah, I. To keep it positive, I thought Henshaw was really, really good and he will have impressed a lot of people, I think. Yeah. That yeah. And that's, you know, that tackle from Khaleesi to stop him getting his try was remarkable. Um, and it takes, it's. I think it's quite significant that it took something that remarkable to stop him from scoring at any point in those three tests, actually. Yeah, see, see Khaleesi was one of my other belters just because I kind of felt like we need yeah. to kind of address it. I mean, just... Uh, <laughs> 
Jack, he was just phenomenal across the three tests. Everything you would want your flanker to be. Yeah. He was just relentless. An utter, utter arsehole from start yeah. to finish like, in, in perfect. all the tests. Perfect. Just, and then we'd come off the, 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 you know, he comes off the pitch and is just the nicest man. <laughs> you know I mean? He's like, <laughs> great caption. Like, perfect. Yeah. He nailed that balance. I also thought, uh, shout out to the Kanyo Am, who I thought was stupidly good. Like, it hurts me to say that Jonathan Davis is no longer the best outside centre in the world, but I think the evidence is quite overwhelming. <laughs> like, yeah, it's only a day, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the Kanyo Am might just be even the tiniest bit better than Chris Harris as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that. I think also the thing about the Kanye Ram is I was trying to work out earlier who they would have replaced him with at 13 if he'd got injured. And I was like, would, have, would they just have like moved DLND out one and put Stain in maybe? Or like Nkosi maybe? But basically I think Am is irreplaceable in that team. His yeah. role in that defence, which is so central to everything they do well, is like he's absolutely integral. And when he does get the chance to attack, he doesn't need anything at all really as he showed you know just the tiniest bit of a flicker of an opportunity yeah um let's do bams then shall we have you got any any we've got any more belters before we move off from the positive well, i was just gonna say it happened if you care about oh, life, good point yeah. yeah yeah fair enough yeah like there were no career ending injuries i think i can't remember <laughs> any it was, a really good, it was a really good one in that respect, wasn't it? In terms of like attrition, yeah. you normally get a, a couple of that are sent home. We 12 people in the hospital after any of the games. No one lost an eyeball. No one, did, no one went. Did, did anybody go? I don't think anybody went home. People didn't travel nobody out home, there, but no. nobody went home. No. No. And, you know, I think really? just the fact that it happened in the circumstances, given, you know, like there was a lot of unease beforehand about whether it was a good idea to go to South Africa in the circumstances, whether it should have gone to Australia, whether it should have been done in the UK, blah, blah, blah. Like, it happened. They, The tests, at least, went off smoothly. The line, <laughs> well, <laughs> they went they, off. They all happened in the way they were roughly planned to. And, you know, I think, actually, if it had been pushed back, it wouldn't have been pushed back for a year, it would have been cancelled. And I think if yeah. you value the Lions as a concept. This will have been unsatisfying in a lot of ways, but it did happen and it will happen next time. And that's quite important. <laughs> it's not like massively uplifting, but it's a good thing. We got through it. Yeah. It happened. They, they fulfilled their they fulfilled their contractual obligations <laughs> yeah. to their sponsors Sky and broadcasters. Very happy and whoever sponsored. Yeah, Vodafone are happy. <laughs> yeah, Vodafone. Thrilled. Yeah. We might come on to that later. I've got uh, when when we talk about the future of the Lions. Um, Bams, then, uh, Reeve, what, what have you got for Bams? Oh, the whinging. Oh, the whinging. <laughs> Just, like in every sense, all encompassing whinging. The fact that I wasn't online that much and still got a real strong sense of how much whinging there is, like, deeply concerns me. Like, how much more was there? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I. Genuinely, after I watched the first test 24 hours late because I was at a wedding the day before. Um, and for the first time in my life, I committed properly to no spoilers because my dad is a proper crybaby about like spoilers in live sport, he just ruins it for him entirely. So I was like, Nope, didn't check my phone, did not participate in anything. And I came out of it. <laughs> One of the first things I texted a few friends was like, I genuinely thought Nick Berry was pretty good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which a number of people responded very quickly to tell me to not put that take on Twitter. <laughs> um, but I mean, so I thought the Hamish Watson thing was probably more than a yellow. I thought some of those South African tries were 50 50, and you could feel a bit hard done by. I wouldn't have made a 64 minute video about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it mildly. But. Uh, I thought he communicated really clearly, actually. I yeah. thought his unwillingness to get dragged into nonsense with the captains was fine. I thought he played sensible advantages that felt like actual advantages as opposed to arbitrary counts of seconds. And I thought he was really, really efficient and clear communicating with the TMO. And it's not really a belter because obviously it's got lost on everything else. But for me, it's a bam that those qualities are now going to get sort of lost in the nonsense of the epic video I, about performance. I, 
I thought Ben O'Keefe had an all right game in the second test as well. They were all fine. Yeah. They what were all fine. Any actual refereeing howler. They were all yeah. fine. I think it's, it's maybe that thing where because they were expo- you, you, you massively exposed as a referee. In I think in rugby in particular, because the laws are so bloody complex yeah. and, and needlessly so as well, and they keep changing it. So we have, you know, we constantly have to kind of relearn the, the game and relearn them. Held up as like one of the best referees ever, and he freely admits that he hasn't read a law book and lots of the time when he comments, he doesn't seem to have any idea of what the modern law might be. Is annoying, right? But also like just generally an indication of how hard it is to be a good referee, <laughs> like. Yeah, um, but I think, and I think that's you know, if if you if you if you subjected anybody in any job to that level of scrutiny after a day's work, we'd all come up short and have had absolute also, I'm tired. I'm like reasonably <laughs> certain about this, but um, on all referees, amateur. Like, why? Why? For one thing, because Wayne Barnes is a barrister. Right. Yeah. He has like a day job, and I think most of them do. Why do we ask people to do the most important job that's ludicrously complex and demanding, where they're exposed to ridiculous amounts of scrutiny and frequently just get thrown under the bus? Like, how many times has World Rugby gone, oh, yeah, that referee was just completely wrong about that call? So, like, have at it, lads, on social media. How? <laughs> Why does anyone want to be a referee? Like, oh my God. It can't um, possibly pay enough to be worth all of that matter. well according to the this is i'm not entirely sure this is correct this is the first result that's come up on google so it may be wrong <laughs> this is rugby that. referees category based on 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 salary charge so per match is 1.5 thousand us dollars and they get bonuses and their yearly income is 220,000 US dollars. I don't think this is a real thing. I know, I know. That's not is that a referee in an American sport? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> said, otherwise, otherwise, I'm going to change career right now. I've got a good memory. I can boss people around. <laughs> I'll just turn to the top. Sounds fine. Um, yeah. I super, just, I, so, I, super, super rugby, super rugby referees a full time they get a six figure salary and a car. Right. Well that's fine. I mean that sounds that's I don't know what the currency uh exchange rate is like, but that seems, you know like it does. I mean I, I would imagine in super rugby you're getting a nice car. I don't know what kind of car you're getting if you're refereeing the United Rugby Championship to be honest. <laughs> like Something from the it's definitely from a former Soviet bloc. Is it a <laughs> Just like the only, <laughs> I don't know enough about cars to make car jokes. I'll be honest. I but don't I know if I, I think the thing with Barnes is because because Wayne Barnes had a career beforehand. Um, Maybe he just really likes being a barrister as well as being. I a think referee. that's it. I think that's it with Wayne Barnes is that he's and I think because he does commercial or property law, I don't think it's like. I don't think it's like a time sensitive kind of law where you have you get a phone call and you have to be down the courthouse to defend someone for murder. I'm gonna keep an eye on the comments section now just because like Wayne Barnes is like mate. I'll <laughs> 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 have you know. <laughs> I'll have you know that you know if someone threatens me with judicial review, I have to reply within three days. <laughs> I reply to all of my emails in a timely prompt manner. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, I mean, I just kind of think maybe, maybe, maybe it is just brain harm. Like, it just seems generally that referees have an incredibly difficult job, and you know, we know now how much anal- like performance analysis they have to do, how much fitness work they have to do. Like, it just seems like a really, really tough gig. And aside from just the kind of meanness of attacking a referee for stuff you don't like. Just one thing we hard. talked, I'd be interested in your take, take on this, both of you, because one thing we talked about last week is we were saying, it, uh, do referees talk too much? And is that part of the problem, that they're almost coaching players? And, you know, um, a couple of lads that we have on the pod normally, put, you know, still play amateur rugby. And so you play amateur rugby, the referee doesn't, you know, you have a bit back and forward, but he's not telling you to leave it. He's not telling you to, you know. It's one of my, it's one of my big, big bugbears is that, you compare it to like football and you, <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have this like, okay. If, no. if it's five seconds to use the ball at the back of a ruck from the scrum off, if that's the same equivalent rule in football, if you've got like five seconds to take a throw in, 
if they don't play it, the referee blows up and they lose possession. It goes to the other side. You see it like frequently enough. So why are we saying use it? Why are we saying leave it? Why are we doing all this sort of stuff? You, we've shown, like, um, I think was it you were saying that Suz was saying he will drop a scrum in the first, in the opening Z- sort of second Z- game. Xander, yeah. Xander, sorry. Will drop a scrum at the start of a game to gauge where the referee's at. Smart tactic. But it shows that teams are willing to feel out where the referee's at. Now, if they can feel out where the referee is at and how he's choosing to ref, like, how he's choosing to interpret the breakdown or the scrum or whatever, why can that not be extended to other aspects of the game? Why can they not learn that shit is going to blow up if it's like five seconds for a, for a box kick or use it from the back of a ruck? If they blow up and get pinged for it, they won't do it again. Well, you well, said that's how many players have got a red card for a high tackle and done it again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm kidding. I do broadly agree with you. I think there's... A little bit of it, like I don't really mind them saying use it to be like I started counting your five seconds now. Unless you're Rob Harley counting into minus one, minus two, minus three, which is always fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there is generally too much coaching, and I think if players or referees either side feel that amount of coaching is required, then we need to simplify the law book because it's silly. Um. And maybe it does give like it does give the referee kind of more prominence in a way that's not that's not necessarily welcome. Um, I saw, I saw, I'm gonna I'm just gonna jump in there and slightly like disagree because that rule of of using it after five seconds that's a really simple rule. Like oh, yeah, there are aspects of the rule book. The, 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 there are aspects of the rule book. The, the law book, sorry, that definitely need to be simplified. But there are things that definitely are very simple in terms of if you do this wrong, it's very binary. There are lots of things in rugby that are not binary, as as Rassi's video showed, that you can look at any single breakdown and penalise any number of players for a number of things. But something as simple as use it seems mad that, like, player, we're saying that players can't count to five themselves. No, and even they really think, like I know, I know, I know. What, I know some of them can't. I know you're going to talk about Gareth Davis again. Um, <laughs> I'm not that mean. But, I was not. Oh no! Okay, was Sorry, that, was, that was that was Tavis Noyle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it was um, like even if in the heat of battle you might be counting a bit slower than you think, or your heart rate can change how you perceive. Like when you're at the gym and you're like heart rates up, a, a song that's quite fast paced will like sound slower. I know it sounds like a bit of a tangent, but your counting might be off in your own head. But if you get a feel for where the ref's at, because he blows up without even realising that you've taken more than five seconds in his mind to move that ball, you can do it. You can. You won't make that same mistake again, like with red cards. It's not a, it's not a difficult rule to change. No, I don't think it's a complicated rule, and I'm pretty sure all professional rugby players can at least count to five. <laughs> I'm all just meant... Um, uh... <laughs> pretty sure. Uh, I'm all just meant, you know, like... Your perception of the ball being out and ready to play is not necessarily the same as the ref- does the referees. I just mean like I don't have a problem with the referee being like I have decided that ball is out and ready to play now. And if you don't play it, I'm going to ping you. Yeah. Just because your angles are different, it's not just a matter of counting. And like you could argue that the way players get to set up from rooks now and they take all that time in order to box kick is frustrating and annoying and maybe we don't want it but like it is currently an important part of the game and I can see why the player might be like that extra half a second is important enough that I would like to know that the referee has decided the ball's out or not that that's all I meant but I do in general agree with you like I think it, yeah it's stuff like no hands I mean like no hands like what that's a that's that's basically telling point. someone you're I've caught you cheat I've, I've basically caught you yeah. fouling and breaching but the laws of the game it, yeah like, yeah. I'm just telling you to stop it, and they they shot you know they shot hundreds of times a game here, no hands. It's like, well, like blow the whistle then because he's. So the pub I used to oh, well. watch the games in, um, one of the kind of regulars was like a former a former international referee. I don't think like test uh, tier one test, but like um, but like properly experienced like test referee. Uh, he used to do this really annoying thing where whenever like random people would ask our group what the penalty was, he'd tell them that they had to ask me. Um, <laughs> you know, like, this is like a really lovely stand for feminism, but now I like I have to guess what the penalty was, and I don't know. It's a breakdown. There were like twelve different things happening. 
Well, I said this to him one time and he was like, yeah, I'm a former referee. I can see even more things happening at the break <laughs> than you can. I've got no idea what they've paid it for. Like, there's at least some things that I might have blown the whistle for there. I don't know what that referee picked or if it was something else. So I can right. see, again, like I can see a logic in a referee being like, look, this isn't important enough to blow the whistle now. I'm going to tell you and then next time you get blown. But like, but we already have that. We. We already have that in the conversations with them about the captains, about yellow cards, about saying next foul is going to be a yellow. Now, if you, Tammy, are saying, right, we're seeing no hands, no hands, no hands, hundreds of times in a game, if the ref's seeing a, an individual consistently doing that, just ping them. Like, like yeah. why are we in a situation yeah. where, where you can have the conversation about gross infringements and have conversations with captains about the next infringement of that kind being a yellow card, why is that not that if we're going to be that sort of involved in coaching the players through the game as they are, at least at least introduce that level of consistency, because you say they all had good games, but there was there was they, they had a they had a conversation at the start of the um, was it? I think it was the second test. Second test. Yeah, they had a conversation where well, they had a conversation within about two minutes. We had handbags and um, Khaleesi and Alan Wynn were brought over and said, right, none, no more of that. And we had several handbags after that and still nothing was done about it. So like, again, again, no one had a howler, but in terms of like managing the game, there's definitely some things that need to be addressed there, it's, which is why it's frustrating. As a parent, I can say that if you, if, <laughs> if you're going to give somebody two or three warnings, game then when you man. come, then when you come to actually discipline them, they will quite rightly kick off. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you kept saying yeah. next time next time next time and i've done it and now you've cracked well what what was wrong with the other few times when you threatened to do something and well, the second set of handbags in that game i was like screaming to just give yellow cards to both sides i was like i don't even care if my player gets a yellow here like this is just yeah, just get this just now get control of the game yeah but again i think this is like i mean first of all i think that's just like it's so common in most rugby matches so you know it's not a hollow because it's just all yeah, the games happens. and it's so often that you have that kind of problem whether and i think this goes back to my original point like it's just really hard to be a referee because like <laughs> the screeching like outrage morality around this player did not deserve to have their reputation tarred for life <laughs> with a yellow card because they were like the third time the team went offside or something it's like who would be a referee honestly like i, I think what am i so over analyzed and like yeah i would have given yellow cards for those but like i mean and also not a real referee so yeah, well, well, one of my bams and i think this it's linked to the referee and is it, it's the the way that the springboks have stretched the laws throughout the whole series with uh, particularly i think with with the the coach the on-field coaching stuff and essentially they've had a 16th man i mean at that that they're not in that third test where you had their physio Basically, oh, organizing, the organizing, the, organizing the defense. Yeah, I mean, that's a sixteenth. That's a sixteenth player. Yeah. That's where the fullback is normally. But I think that's a lot for ref. You, you're then expecting referees to deal with that. Now, that should be a third. I don't. That, that should be a fourth official issue. Yeah. So that, that's what fourth officials there to do. I mean, they're there to kind of like do the, make sure that what the studs are okay on the substitutes as they come on and and make sure everything's orderly. But they should also be in charge of the off-field staff. And it was interesting, where I was, um, in our podcast group chat that we've got, uh, Craig was saying it was, um, who's the, not Razzie, who's who's the actual head coach of? Right, so when he was, he was physio at Munster, he used to do that. And he did it for South Africa in the World Cup because yeah. he still had his physio pass and they could yeah. like put him as, which, you know, when he did it in the World Cup, we were all like, ha ha ha, what a hilarious exploitation of the rules. Like, the loophole is there. It's not South Africa's fault that the loophole is there. They, you know, and I'm, I kind of think that it is true, but it, it's only like funny and endearing up to a point. Yeah. And the point was, I think, doing it in the World Cup, basically because they beat England in the final. Let's face it, if they'd beaten one of us or someone we liked more, we'd have found it a lot less charming. Um, but definitely the extent of like having a medic in the in goal area yelling fold at the defence is like you can't. That's so far think, past the line of the spirit yeah. of that loophole. I think I think the difference with England is that 
you can rewatch that World Cup final and say that South Africa were comprehensively the better of the two teams oh, there. We'll be in anyway. we, lost, we lost a three-game test series by three points. Hmm. Like, that's feel... the level of fine margins we're talking about here. And we saw in the second test how important it was for a certain Mr. Laws to fold and avoid that Mapimpi try when he didn't fold. Can you imagine if we'd have had somebody in our end goal area shouting fold as well as Biggs? He still might not have moved. He's calling laws. He can do what he wants. But <laughs> well, <maybe. laughs> the fact is, is that we can show, we can't, we can't, we can do what ifs till the end of time. But you're quite right. I think that's what, that's the difference in the levels here is that South Africa comprehensively beat England in that World Cup final, whereas things were a lot tighter over the course of these three games. And those things can make the difference. And it almost seems to me a little bit like, it's almost like the Springboks are evolving into the professional-ism of rugby quicker than the referees can. It's a mm. bit like when we go back to the captain's challenge, that, that world rugby are dropping things in here and saying things and, uh, and setting boundaries. And teams are now so organised and professional outfits that they can just work around them and find these loopholes quicker than world rugby can even react. And... That's the sort of thing that you'd expect like an NFL franchise to do or um, a Premier League football team to do. But the officiating around those sports is so dialed in and operating at the same level as the as the franchises themselves. that You're never going to have that where you've got a situation of a, of a, um, a physio on the sidelines trying to run, like communicate tactics to people. And it feels like the teams are getting there and the officiating staff aren't to I me. The, the worry yeah. for me, the worry for me, is this is all. It, this is going to end up undermining player welfare it, yeah, on on the pitch because Town, Gregor Townsend was saying after that match, you know, that particularly South Africans were using every break and play. One of them drops with cramp, stomach upset. You know, the, the funny, you know, the finger has a bit of a, a twinge. And there's a break in play. I mean, what you know, it was ridiculous. Like 23 minutes, the ball was in play for in that game, Honestly, which is ludicrous. ludicrous. So Gregor Townsend suggests quite legitimately you do what football do, which is you I remove the player from the field. Don't. I can't but, believe they don't. <laughs> but I think the the risk of that then is that the flip side of that is do players who are genuinely injured then not remove themselves from the field of play it because cat, it is a catch 22 yeah. yeah although to be honest players now who are genuinely injured frequently don't remove themselves from the field of play yeah. and they've got all the time in the world so i don't know that that's and the other thing is like i think you're right phil in that <clears throat> and i think a couple of the referees sort of discreetly mentioned this to some journalists over the tour that like it's pretty hard when it's very, very clear that all the coaches are doing their level best to outwit you on the law book front and find yeah. yet another like loophole for them to exploit. And it must be like absolutely ridiculous to have some of those like conversations with the captains and the coaches before the test where they're like, right, what like hilarious move are you going to pull this time that you want me to like, <laughs> defend on finals? Um, or like, what thing are you going to make a fuss about so you can exploit while I just like try and do my job? Um, but it is like, it is really, really difficult for them. And I think um, there are lots of areas where already like really well-intentioned measures are like being taken advantage of. I know there are more than the time the French prop pretended he was concussed in his groin. Well, uh, I can also the, the last but, Lions tour, Finn Russell got his, got his one and only cap on the last Lions tour because he was an HIE replacement for um, Dan Bigger. Finn Russell was on the field for seven minutes the HIA process is a 10 minute process. Joe, so it's yeah. not. Do, it, it's. Yeah. And I think so. Wayne Barnes did a. He has like a sort of ghost written column in the Times or the Sunday Times. And he had like quite a list of examples basically where people have just been like shamelessly taking the mick out of the refs. And there's just absolutely nothing they can do about it because like they are bound by player welfare concerns. And I yeah. do think you're just going to see that more unless World Rugby cracks down on it. And you could very easily get into a kind of moralising hashtag rugby values thing about that. But, like, it would be bad. Rugby is a dangerous enough game. Like, we don't need to make it worse. And I think also, like, again, sorry for everyone who hates cricket out there, especially the 100. Um, but, like, very, very briefly, something that the 100 have demonstrated is that if you have a will to speed things up, 
including refereeing decisions and all other off field stuff, you can make it happen actually. Like they've really condensed the length of games, not just because of the format, but partly because they've just absolutely insisted that the kind of time slot is respected. And rugby, world rugby and rugby authorities could actually say, like, we're not having this anymore. A first half is not going to last 64 minutes unless there is a genuinely like outstanding reason and a serious injury. Like, you've got to speed this process up. We'll give you more TMOs. We'll give you more linesmen if that's what it takes. Like, we won't tolerate water you've, coming on if it's not hot enough, stuff like that. You've got to think broadcasters are going to start kicking off as well. I mean, Sky it right. probably didn't matter. I, mean, they probably, I don't know what they had on after the third test. It was probably some rerun of like a 1996 Man United game. But I think they talked. I think they talked about it for another like hour and a half because they had it on the main event channel. They just created yeah. a channel for it, so it's fine. Where, but, but that you know that Six that Nations. happens in Six Nations. Yeah, BBC. All of a sudden, EastEnders is running late, and the world's up in arms. And, that, and that's yeah. a big that, that's a big deal, or it's ITV well, and advertisers. Part of the reason that cricket competition has so aggressively like sort of pursued that approach is in order to sell it to the broadcasters as like a really clean, quick slot, and um, that like won't run over into senders basically, yeah. um, or whatever the yeah whatever the other version is. Uh, so like it is doable. It's obviously harder in rugby. Oh, yeah. I feel like cricket is a very simple game. But, like it's pretty complicated when it wants to be <laughs> like. I do. I, I really hope that this general sort of mess of a lot of that kind, that side of things from this to prompts World Rugby to just take some really quite aggressive measures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. To restrict a lot of that stuff. It's not going to happen until England get embarrassed doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking. Nothing. Oh, nothing we, to we, we need Eddie Jones to do an hour-long video before anything happens about this. I think maybe if South Africa yeah. do it in New Zealand as well, and the New Zealand complain, you know, because the power. Well, of we're going. We're going. Like going back to that Razzie video, he would have. A, like he makes some really good points about the refereeing that we've all just discussed about how difficult it is to be and the level of time wasting that can go on and the problems with interpreting the laws. If he really wanted to make that case. He could have done a video half the length, but of 15 minutes Lions decisions, 15 minutes Springboks decisions. And it would have made exactly the same point, but he didn't want to. There we go. No, because he's Razzie Trump. And that's. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. 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 What, Phil, Phil, what have you got for a BAM? Tom Curry. Good. <laughs> good. I don't have to say good. I don't have to say that. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He is. He is. He's a really good rugby player. He is. He is a really good rugby player. But he has some sort of weird, like, brain fart moments that just, if somebody could grab him by the scruff of the neck and sort those areas out, he'd be Hamish Watson. Um, <laughs> but that's which is, which that's is the problem. Of, and that's I. I can't. I could not for the life of me understand. By the th- we get to the third test. And maybe they did drop Hamish Watson because of that tackle in the first test. And that was the reason why they've done it. But I cannot for the life of me understand why Hamish Watson didn't start the third test, given the amount of penalties Tom Curry personally gave away. Thank you. Thank you. That that one rush of blood to the head does not does not trump all of the stupid penalties that he gave away over the course of the tour. It just it doesn't make sense to me. I think this goes back a little bit to kind of what I was alluding to earlier, that I think a lot, I don't want to say confused, I'm not quite sure what the word I want is, but <clears throat> I think the selection for these three test teams showed that this was a new coaching team. Mm-hmm. Because as much as people will say, oh, we really should have attacked more like we did when Finn was on the field, I'm pretty sure it was the game plan to attack like that all the time. <laughs> it's like, otherwise, why would you pick that squad? Like, that would be insane. And it's not like Finn wasn't picked until the third test. He was well, injured until the third test. Far- right? We said before, Far- the stuff Farrell did when he came on, he was doing Finn's stuff. So the plan had obviously always been to have start with Bigger and end with Finn. But they just had to say to Owen Farrell, can you please come on and pretend to be Finn Russell yeah. because he's injured? There's no work. There is absolutely no way in the world. As much as Gatland likes to take the mick out of Eddie Jones, he did not bring Marcus Smith on that tour to replicate Finn Russell in training unless Finn Russell was a really important part of training. Like, yeah. he didn't do it for the lols, yeah. as funny as it would have been if he had. 
Um, so I think that that thing of the first the first team selection for the test team, uh, where they said like everybody came in with a different twenty three, and there were only like seven players in common, is like that seems alarm bells. Cons- yeah, con- yeah. Considering that they very clearly had a game plan. And they had a clear, like a squad that was clearly like picked to execute that game plan. I know that it was chaos in all the warm up games, and they didn't get to practice a lot of the combinations they would have wanted, and they didn't get a lot of the players to get the game time they would have wanted. But it still seems really, really concerning that you could only have seven players out of, I'm assuming it's the 15 and some of the bench players they're in agreement on. And I wonder if. Like to go back to your point, like Tom Curry's selection was kind of one of those compromises of like maybe he wasn't everyone's first choice, but he was sort of everyone's second, or like, oh well, he could do some of the stuff that we would have wanted Burn to do, but not all. But then he could also do some of the stuff maybe we would have asked Mish to do. I just I think there was a lot of I never felt like the teams were bad, but they just never seemed quite coherent enough. And I, yeah, I think there was a lot of. I think they, I think they needed more time. <laughs> yeah, got the team and the playing it, squad to get, get that kind of cohesion. But I think Tom Curry might have just repeatedly been a kind of compromise option of. No one can pick the other player they want in this back row, so we're just so going to have him because he kind of does a bit of all of it when he's really good. He runs like a non-playable character in a 90s computer game when you watch him. <laughs> he just holds his hands out rigidly and just shuffles backwards and forwards. <laughs> he looks like he's Ram not- Man from He-Man, which I know as a reference is probably you're too young. Both of you are too young to know who Ram Man was no, for I He-Man. I get that. I get Ram Man. I mean, yeah. I think old enough. I just never had any computer games. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I, think, I think the other thing that was, they obviously decided as well that they weren't going to show their hand but until the yeah. tests, which is a fundamentally stupid thing to do because you're a scratch side you and kind of need to run you exactly you're gonna to have yeah. to run some practice some of your plays and run some of your combinations together because training however good training is and however ferocious all, all the kind of the bin juice players are, are being in the tackle and stuff, you, you can't replicate it until you're on the pitch. So I think quite right. We all thought, well, it's Burn and Watson because that's the ones they've tended to be going with. And then it gets to the test and going, aha, we've we've decided to go with a completely untested back three combination. And again, so I think some of that will have been like, you know, as much as I reckon, as much as I was certain that Alan Jones was going to come back on the tour, and I reckon Gats was probably like, I'm not all that worried. You still had to plan for at least the first test without him. And maybe they would have had Courtney Laws as the starting uh, tight head lock. And then that kind of shifted things around because they did want his, you know, like as much as we can laugh at Courtney Laws, he does offer a lot. As a lock, not a blind side in my opinion, but um, especially when you're playing El South Africa, he's a big, big guy and he's a hard, aggressive player and they did kind of need part of that. And then so once he's he in up, position defensively. Yeah, as long as, as long as he's standing where he should be and doing what he should be. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, they were to know that he was going <laughs> to... Uh, and this is the I could have told them. I could have told them he would have been lazy, but never mind. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Gatler. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, but, um, mate, I think, don't I pick just, him. I think there was a lot of that. Like, yeah, you know, the fact that Murray was on the bench in the first test, um, you know, like I would I would say that Ali Price is the better player, right? And certainly in the better form. But it seems like they would have wanted Murray to start and Price to be on the bench to speed yeah. up the game in the last 20 minutes and they couldn't do that because they wanted to have a substitute for if Alan Wynne Jones needed to go off and you saw that again in the third test and I, I just think there was too many compromises being made and you know what, South Africa are a really good team, it's really difficult as a scratch team to win, I actually think you know, it's really frustrating because it was so close but the fact that it was so close is quite impressive. It is, I mean I think that one of my bams was the Kind of, it was Alan Wynn Jones and Conor Murray, and particularly in the third test, some of the decisions that they made. And I, I know we've been trying, I've seen this with Alan Wynn Jones before, and some of the decisions that he makes when he's been captain for Wales. I think, particularly when he first started taking over for Warburton, is making the wrong decisions when they're given penalties. Yeah, that there was three occasions, 
at the weekend where there's 28 minutes to go to the corner and I think they they end up with a scrum that gets dropped. I think it's a 36-minute one might be when Tom Curry messes up them all needlessly. Yeah. Then it and that's you know, those were both kickable penalties and that you, you they go in at half time and they're 16 19 6 up. And then again at 16 13 down, Murray decides to kick to the corner. Right, yeah, right. I think Alan Winner's got better at that with Wales, but I definitely agree. He, I think he I think he struggled quite a bit um when he first took over the captaincy, actually. Like he was always a really inspirational leader. But that didn't necessarily mean that he was getting a lot of the decisions right. And I think he struggled to talk to referees as well. Like I think he just struggled to control his temper. I was gonna say um, compared to Sam, he was he was yeah. not bad. I mean, he like improved a lot. Um yeah. but yeah, I don't think I think the first decision to go to the corner, fine. Because if Curry doesn't screw it up, that's a try. And I think maybe even the second decision to go to the corner. Fine, because the first time, if we didn't screw it up, it would have been a try, right? Like, yeah. you can make that argument. The third time, take the point. Take the point. There's only... It's not just the thing of, like, it's not working now. It's the time you're wasting. Like, yeah, the first time makes sense because there was a reasonable chance and we showed that. And yeah. The second time does make... There's a perfectly good argument for it. Maybe you would have gone for the points. But, but I can see there's a fair argument for that just because... It should have worked the first time. But I do think there's a little bit that ego getting in the way of like, we've committed to this course of action now. Like, we are going to score the try and we're not going to be like pushed off, except then it's even worse when you are. Yeah. <laughs> and we were. Because <laughs> um, that yeah, just has Chris Rock. Which, I mean, again, wasn't the worst decision. It was just executed. It wasn't the worst decision. They just got absolutely mugged for it. But yeah. yeah. They're it's it's very really easy. Hind, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's very easy. It's very easy to sit back and say, "Yeah, you should have take, taken the points." But and I do I do agree, Cammy. That it was frustrating to see how many points were effectively left out there. Yeah, especially when you know, like, not even just the narrative thing of like the potential of Mornay staying to come on and kick <laughs> at the end, but like you just know how many close games now are decided. Yeah. By three points, by a breakdown penalty in the last ten minutes, like and Wales mm. know that because they've won games like that as well as lost them. To South and Africa. Scotland know that because we always lose games like that. Yeah, like enough of those players on the- England have also lost games because of some dumb penalties they conceded towards the end. Like everybody really on the pitch should have been aware of the like how fine a line discipline is. Like, it's all very well and good being like, oh, we're not going to cheat. But like, it's an interpretation. It's easy to be forced into giving away a penalty, especially against a clever team. Like, I think you've always got to give yourself more leeway in a game like that. And yeah, we should have kicked the point to give ourselves that leeway. Yeah. Um, Anybody got any more final bams before I... Um, we're going to say goodbye to our, our, our normal... Listeners, and then we've got some Patreon extra discussion to have. Rather, you swear. Final, yeah. Yes, swearing time. I'm very quick. Uh, my final bomb is uh, not winning the second test and therefore not getting the Cats at a Rave test team with Marcus Smith at 10, yeah. Ben at 12, and Sam Simmons at like six for fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would have been hilarious. And the pure joy would have brought me to see Gatlin be like, I have picked the most hilarious team. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a real tragedy that that will stay with me longer than a lot of the other disappointments. 2025, Ray. 2025. <laughs> Greg, uh, 2025, and we might come on to this in the Patreon, but Gregor Townsend's involved. Who knows? All bets are off. Who knows? Who knows what could happen? And very quickly, I checked out the player ages of Evan in the squad, and with the exception of Chris Harris, all the Scotland players in that squad are 29 or younger, yep. which, in my mind, no guarantee. Like, you can be thinking about that next tour if you keep playing well. Cats at a rave can still happen. Oh, yeah, we can get full cats at the rave. Next time. It's Australia. Yeah. You can do anything you want against Australia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Phil, you got any final bams before we go? No, no, I've got mine out of the way. <laughs> right. Okay. We're going to say goodbye now. Um, thank you very much to everyone for listening um, on our normal audio podcast. We're going to say goodbye. We're just going to go and speak to the patrons now. So I'm going to try and see if this works. Hopefully it will. i do it. I don't know why we're waving, Phil. I assume that the people... I know, I just assumed it was going to be the, the audio cut over. <laughs> it was just an instinct. <laughs> 
you can 